Uh, in, book, uh, in books two and three, we have one more hero who's even more famous and more important for American history. Uh, his name uh, is Cincinnatus. Uh, Cincinnatus uh, was an aristocrat who served one term as consul. Uh, and uh, at the end of his term, he was so popular, made himself uh, uh, so, uh, so well loved among the Romans that the other aristocrats urged him to, to uh, uh, take another term as, as consul. And he said, well, that's illegal. And they said, nobody's going to oppose you. Go ahead and do it. You do well. It's, it's okay. And, and uh, Cincinnati says, no, it would be against the law. And if I refuse to accept this term of office, it can only, it can only enhance my reputation. So no, I won't do it. And so uh, he, 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 uh, uh, he turns down their offer. Later on, uh, his son, uh, a, a young man named Kaiso, uh, gets accused of a crime for which, for which he was probably not guilty. Uh, it looks like he's going to be uh, railroaded through the court system in some kind of a kangaroo court, and he's going to be thrown into prison. Uh, there's going to be injustice done. And so the bail that he posted, uh, that put up by his father, Cincinnatus, they agree to sacrifice, and Kaiso flees the country. Cincinnati loses the bail money in this, uh, uh, um, in, in this, uh, saving, uh, this effort to save his son and becomes poor, but he's preserved his honor. He retires to a little three-acre farm across the Tiber River uh, outside the city limits. Uh, now it would be right smack in the city of Rome, but back then across the Tiber was country. He retires to a little farm and there he hoes his cabbage patch, I suppose it was, along with his wife, Rosilia. Uh, one day, <clears throat> uh, the Romans are uh, suddenly discover the danger of uh, the threat of a new enemy. Somebody else uh, from outside the country is attacking, and they say, who can we get? Uh, the situation is desperate. It's urgent. We can't count on the bureaucrats and the Senate to, to come up with a good plan. We need somebody to, to, to deal with this urgent uh, emergency right now. And they say, ah, Cincinnatus. We can make him a dictator. And we know that he'll be honest and won't be corrupted by the power that that will, that will give him because he proved his honesty by his earlier actions, including turning down an illegal offer of a, a second term in the, in the Senate as consul. So all the delegates of the city get into a rowboat and they cross the Tiber and they come to Cincinnati, who's hoeing his cabbages. He sees them coming and he tells his wife to run, get his toga and bring it out because the toga is the symbol of a Roman citizen. He puts it on to meet them with sobriety and gravity as a Roman citizen should. And Rosilia brings out the lemonade and the sweet tea. And they sit down and they say, uh, 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 Cincinnati, here's the problem. We're in emergency uh, status. We need you to be dictator and save the city. Now, um, at this point in history, dictator is an official position that the Romans have come up with, uh, which gives one man absolute power for a limited time of six months. Uh, the Constitution is suspended. Um, all the bureau bureaucracy is cut out. He can do whatever he wants. He has absolute power. A carte blanche, he can do anything he wants, he's not hampered by the normal bureaucratic structures. That's the, the position of dictator. The condition is that the, by the end of six months he has to hand power back to the Senate. So, of course, you can see that much depends on the character of the man you give uh, the dictatorial power to. You don't want to give it to a man uh, who is corrupt because once he has absolute power, why should he give it back? At the end of the six months you can say your term's up and, he, and he'll say, say to you, uh, yeah, who says? So you have to be really careful whom you appoint dictator. Later on in Roman history, the Romans will not be so careful and they will give this position to Julius Caesar and he will appoint himself dictator for life. But here they give this, they, they make this offer of dictator to Cincinnati and he says, okay, I'll do it. He crosses the river the very next day when he could have slept in late in the presidential palace and drove around a little bit in the presidential Bugatti. Instead, he gets up early, he appoints a master of horse, he rallies the troops and he says, let's go do this boys. And in less than two weeks, he drives out the enemy, complete victory. And then, and here's the important point, he resigns his commission and goes back to his farm. He's a citizen, but he's a farmer. He doesn't lay claim to his power. He goes back to his farm, having resigned his commission. He could have kept it for six more months and enjoyed the perks of power, and nobody would have complained. But he didn't. He resigns his commission and goes back to his farm. Now, uh, <clears throat> millennia later... Uh, in uh, the founding of, of America, we have a similar situation. The Americans rise up in, in, uh, in, in, in revolution against the British. George Washington, a farmer from Virginia, is appointed the general of the Continental Army. He carries out the job, and by, the, by 1783, he's defeated the British, and then George Washington resigns his commission and goes back to his farm. 
Uh, this is commemorated uh, in a number of ways. Uh, the state house, uh, the, the, the state capital of Maryland in Annapolis preserves a room uh, just the way it looked when Washington resigned his commission there. And there's a statue, a sort of mannequin of George Washington holding out in his right hand the scroll on which is written his commission as he gives it back to Congress, returning power to the Senate, not keeping it for himself. Uh, Washington could have kept power longer. Some people say that there was a move to make him king and he said, no, we're, we're gonna have presidents. Now, there were people who wanted Washington to have more than one, more than two terms of office, but after two terms of office in 1797, he, he, he retires uh, to set a, a pattern uh, that presidents should limit uh, their time in office. So uh, the State House in Maryland preserves a statue of Washington resigning his commission. Uh, secondly, uh, and this is a little bit more fun, if you go to the wonderful old city, uh, city of Baltimore, Maryland, in uptown Baltimore, up on top of the hill in, in Old Town, there's a place called Washington Square. It's a park in the shape of a Greek cross that is a, 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 a cross with equal arms. Uh, on, one, uh, on one side street uh, is one of the most wonderful libraries in America called the Peabody Library, the George Peabody Library. It's an absolutely beautiful library with the many stores of, stories of galleries of books, a beautiful black and white checkerboard floor, and then a glass ceiling. And if you ever go to Baltimore, you should visit it. On another one of the side streets nearby is one of the best uh, art galleries in the East. It's a small private art gallery called the Walters Gallery. It's got a tremendous collection of ancient, medieval, and modern art. But at the center... Oh, and on, on, on another corner uh, is one of the, one of the uh, um, great old churches of early America, too. But in the center of this cross is the Washington Monument. Now, it was built by the same guy who would later build the famous Washington Monument in Washington, D.C., the great obelisk that stands 555 feet, feet tall. But the original Washington Monument in, in Baltimore is this column over 150 feet tall, a cylindrical Doric column, a Doric means that the very top of the column, the capital, is plain. There's no scroll work. There's no fancy leaves and vines like, like uh, the Ionic and Corinthian style. And on top of the, on top of the column, standing, uh, I think, something like 180 feet high, is a great statue of George Washington. Uh, and here's the significant part. In this, uh, in this depiction of Washington, the sculptor has made him standing in a Roman toga, and his right arm is extended, pointing south, toward Annapolis, Maryland, which is 30 miles south. He's pointing south to where he resigned his commission and he's dressed in a Roman toga. And everybody back then had a classical education and everybody who walked through Baltimore knew what this statue was symbolizing. Washington is Cincinnatus. And they all knew their Livy and they all knew their Cincinnatus. He did what Cincinnatus did. He did the job as a man of integrity and then resigned a commission that he could have kept, uh, maybe corruptly, he resigns his commission and goes back to his farm. On the side of the base of the monument, there's, uh, there, uh, there's inscribed the, the, the date of his uh, resigning his commission because that's important. Uh, and if you go uh, up to the very top of the statue, which you can do inside, well, you used to be able to do inside a spiral staircase inside. I think it's closed down now. Um, but um, you get a great view of the city from this Washington monument. Uh, there's another statue uh, that shows just how much the Americans identified George Washington with this old hero, Cincinnatus. Uh, in the capital of Virginia, in Richmond, in the State House, uh, there's a statue that was actually made even earlier. The Washington Monument of Baltimore I just described was built between 1815 and 1829. Uh, but there's a statue in the State House of Virginia in Richmond that was built by the French sculptor, uh, carved by the French sculptor named Houdon, and it was built in the 1790s. And it depicts Washington standing uh, with uh, a walking staff in his right hand, and a plow symbolizing his agrarian love of the soil, which makes him a patriot, behind him. But on his left side, there is represented the bundle of fasces, the Roman rods of power that, 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 that refer to a political authority and military might. Uh, and this, uh, this uh, sculpture in the State House of Richmond, Virginia, is explicitly meant to depict Washington as the American Cincinnatus. Uh, and you can look this up on the internet, you can go visit Richmond, Virginia, you can see these things. And then finally, uh, the, the, the knowledge in the American founding fathers uh, in, in the early American Republic among educated people generally was, uh, um, uh, of Cincinnati was so profound that a group of, uh, of men who had been officers in the Continental Army started a society called the Society of the Cincinnati. Now, Cincinnati, for you Latin scholars, uh, you'll, as you'll recognize, uh, is the plural masculine nominative of the singular Cincinnatus. 
In other words, it's the society of the Cincinnatuses. It's a society uh, made up of men who had served in the army and who were devoted to preserving the virtues of patriotism and integrity that Cincinnatus uh, and uh, themselves were trying to preserve. So they called themselves the Society of the Cincinnati and George Washington was one of the original members. Another one of the members, one of the early founders of it, moved to Ohio and founded a city which he gave the name of the society, the city of Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, one wonders how many people who live in the city of Cincinnati, Ohio know where their name comes from. That it comes from this ancient Roman hero who exemplified better than anyone else integrity, patriotism, and real Romanitas, as uh, Virgil talks about it. So uh, these are some examples of how classical knowledge was deeply embedded in uh, the educated people of early America. Not just the elite, but everybody who got an education got an education in these things.